So when Auntie Anne started, we felt uh, that uh, Auntie Anne's was created uh, by God. It was a modern day Pisces miracle, a miracle, something that defies the odds. And uh, Auntie Anne certainly defied all, all the odds because um, when we started the company, um, we had no formal education, no capital, and we had no business plan. So that's kind of like a disaster for, I mean, that sounds like a, a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so as we got into the company, there's a lot that we had to learn, but there's a couple of things that um, that we knew for sure. And that was that God had created Auntie Anne's uh, as a vehicle to give, number one. And then number two was to be light in the world business. So um, it was... Um, not something that we had planned for, but the the overcome and lead. Uh, I wrote it because I certainly was not equipped or prepared to be the founder and the CEO and leader of an international franchise company. But we soon discovered that uh, God had created Auntie Anne's to be uh, a light, and so we took that um, and we did an acrostic: L, lead by example; I, invest in employees. G, give freely, H, under God, and T, uh, treat all business contacts with respect. So it really became the grid that we used uh, as we made decisions every single day, uh, uh, just through the through the grid of light. And what we're deciding to do right now, does that really follow that model and worked very well for us. And what role did your faith play in, in how you came up with that leadership style? Well, I grew up in the Amish culture and faith has always been a part of my life. And uh, I've been asked that question many, many times in the course of uh, the life of Auntie Anne's. And my answer to that is I I didn't know how to live my life any other way. Um, I always felt like if God is really a part of my life, then he goes with me everywhere I go. And what did that mean? I feel like the acronym LIGHT really helped me to understand um well, for example, let me go back to a story about that. I was uh, I would make my my Monday morning rounds with all of my employees each Monday to say hello, get to know them, hang out with them, and really hear their stories. And um, it became overwhelming to me when I would hear uh, what's going on in their lives. And uh, as I'm walking back to my office one day, I just um, said to God, what, what do you want me to be? Um, an evangelist or a pastor, uh, because that was really my life. I'd never really been in the business world, but I've all I'd always gone to church and we'd been a, a youth pastor. But I think that the way that that then unfolded was for God just was very clear with me. He said, "No, I want you to be salt and light." And I think that so what what that what that did for me was it helped me to really uh, try to understand what does that mean. Um, I knew as a little girl, I always sang the song, this little light of mine, I'm, I'm going to let it shine, but I'd never been in the business world. And so I wasn't sure how that was supposed to play out. And um, when God just um, said, I want you to be salt and light, I was like, well, how do I do that? And he just was very clear with me and said, I'll, I'll teach you. And so um, I just feel like I began to understand that um I knew I was not an evangelist, but I knew that I was, over time, I understood that my leadership role was really about modeling um, the role of Christ, which sounds kind of um, hmm, maybe high and lofty, but if you bring him down into, into your everyday life is what I always did, I realized that it's very doable, and it meant that I didn't have to say everything I knew or preach the gospel everywhere I went. It just meant, to me, it was a sobering thought. And it really, um, it made me feel like this is a like a heavy duty responsibility. I need to know and learn how to be a follower of Christ in the business world. And so I began just to really uh, um, think about that a lot and ask God to show me, what does that mean to be a follower of Christ and take you into the workplace every day? And um, it just became, it really was who I was but it became my way of life in the business world. But I have to tell you, it wasn't something that, um, you know, like we prayed before all of our meals and we prayed before we had business meetings, but uh, it was done in such a way that people accepted who we were as my husband and I being Christian people in the business world. And there was a, a deep respect for 
um, actually the way we lived our lives. It's not so much what we said because we didn't talk about that a lot, but we tried to live out our lives. And I feel like that is what I discovered about light. It doesn't say a word. It simply makes things visible. Salt doesn't speak. It just makes things tasty. And that to me was a, a huge challenge because I'd come from a world where everybody said what they thought and believed and taught and and that's that's great but I could tell my role was changing but it had to come from within who I really was so that I could be and not so much be the person to um, say everything I was thinking all the time. Now did you ever experience any hostility because of your faith in the business world? I never did oh. and I was in that world for uh, 18 years and um, then we sold the company and went on to then I went into the speaking um arena and began to speak about my story. That was a uh, a different setting, but there I was able to actually talk about my faith, not in great detail, but talk about God. And God created ATNs and I, I took him with me to work every day. And I still, to this day, John, I've never, I, I've never experienced uh, hostility. I do feel like today is a very different day and time. Uh, but when I go out and speak, I still, I'm able to be clear uh, about uh, the truth about who God is uh, in my life and without saying a whole lot. And so I think today people are more selective, you know, as far as who they bring to speak. I, I spoke a lot in, uh, you know, um, colleges and universities and all kinds of business um, venues. Um, but I think today people are a little more careful about who they bring into their, you know, workplace to speak. And um, but I'm still in, in both worlds being salt and light. And I, I really enjoy that. I love that because it's, um, Jesus said, we are the light of the world um, and we're the salt of the earth. And I don't know, sometimes I wonder if we're not a little bit too brash too in people's face, you know, about everything. And I, I love to follow the model of Christ. And he just said, come follow me. Now, of course, before you became very successful, you faced some obstacles. What were some of those obstacles and how did you deal with those? Mm -hmm. So growing up in the Amish uh, culture was a very safe and uh, I would say secure lifestyle. There was eight of us kids and on the farm. And uh, I, I faced some obstacles as a kid. Uh, my mom and dad were great parents and they taught us about God and going to church and sitting around the table three times a day was um, for meals was just our culture. And so in that setting, I, I felt like they gave me a really good foundation to weather the storms of life and um, had no idea that life at one point would, could be hard. Cause uh, I've always believed at that time, I believe that life is good uh, and God is harsh. And by that, I mean, as long as I'm good God will be pleased with me. And uh, if I break one of the Ten Commandments or, I don't know, do something bad, you know, God may be displeased with me. And what I know today through uh, over seven decades of real life's experiences is that uh, life is hard and God is good. And I'm not confused about that anymore. So what do I mean by that? I just mean that um, experiencing uh, the death of our 19-month-old daughter and a couple of months after that, our grief being uh, so deep and uh, just very difficult to walk through. We were a fairly young couple. I was 27 or 28 years old, and our, she was our youngest um, baby. Angela was her name. And um, experiencing that just really, um, as Angie made her ascent into heaven that day, I began my slow and gradual descent into a world of uh, emotional pain and spiritual confusion because I'd been a good girl, you know, and um, and so then the question became why. And so, uh, Jonas and I both experienced the, gr the grief of her loss. We found it very difficult, almost impossible, to really talk about how we were feeling. So we bottled everything up inside and never really spoke about what's going on in the inside and both grieving kind of alone. Uh, there were no s grief groups or, oh, I'm sure there were books to read, but 
nobody gave us a book to read about grief. So we were just kind of you know, experiencing this completely at a at a at a loss uh, as to how to manage and how to take care of this and or to manage manage it emotionally and spiritually. And so I decided to see my pastor. Um, he invited me to his office to just come and and talk. And I did that, and I was very relieved to be able to. Maybe I maybe I do have the vocabulary to actually tell somebody how I'm feeling. And so I was able to really unload. But when I left his office, before I left his office, he took advantage of me uh, physically. And um, that became um, worse for me than, hard to explain, that became worse than losing our daughter. Uh, because um, as, I, as I left his office, I didn't understand anything about abuse, abuse of spiritual power, um, sexual abuse. I, I was not familiar with that world at all but when i left his office i made a choice and i decided i would never tell anyone what he did to me but that one choice i made um kept me in a life of secrets for almost seven years and uh, life of secrets and abuse um during that whole time without me telling anyone or anyone knowing anything about it so in that in that setting then the only lifeline i had was my pastor who was I was dying inside every day, never telling anyone. Um, um, I went from being a, kind of the life of the party and always having something to do or say, uh, enjoying life to uh, isolation and uh, despair. And um, my only option at one point, I thought I had only one option that would be to, to take my life because um, I knew and I believed for sure I'd gone from being a good girl to a very bad girl, but I didn't understand that it really wasn't my fault. Um, I know a whole lot more about it today than I did back then, and I understand it better. But at that time, it just it felt like life was over for me. I knew that I was unlovable. I knew I was unforgivable, and I knew I was unchangeable. And there was really, there was really no hope for me. But yet, I still wanted to get out of this situation. I still wanted to be a mom. I still wanted to be a, a wife and have a family. And um, that that was kind of the, the um, I guess, the strength in me. It kept me from actually uh, leaving my family or even taking my own life. Now, I'm sure you dealt with anger toward God and perhaps an oh. offended heart. How did you overcome that? Or how did he help you to overcome that? Hmm, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you know, I think that blame, blaming others, uh, the the um, the result of that is anger at God and anger at yourself and anger at I was I was just mad at my husband. He had never done anything wrong. I, he was a good man. He loved me and took care of me and didn't know any anything that was happening at the time. Um, but blaming God and blaming my pastor, um, it, as long as you blame, there, there's no healing for you. And so the anger that I felt inside, I honestly, I had it buried so deep that I did not, I didn't even understand that I was angry. I know that sounds strange, but when I finally went to see a counselor after many years, uh, even after I told my husband my secret, um, and then even years after that, I finally started, uh, went for counseling at Emerge Ministries in Akron, Ohio, Dr. Richard Dobbins. And um, I'll never forget when I sat down and he asked me to tell my story. And I, I hadn't told many people my story and I didn't know where to start. And as I began to tell my story, he just uh, said to me at one point, he said, Ann, um, you know that none of this is your fault. Well, that was, nobody had said that to me. And for, that was almost uh, 15 years after the fact, and um, I carried the the belief that it was all my fault, the guilt and the shame of it all. It was all my fault. So, so the anger at that time, when he told me that truth, and the reason I know it was true is because something inside of me, it, it, it came to life. Like I, I believed him because it was true. It wasn't my fault. And so I think that as I got clarity about what actually happened to me, then my anger, and he asked me at that time, he said, who are you angry at? And first of all, I said, well, I'm not angry. 
I, de I even denied the fact that I was angry. And he said, but just let me ask you again, who are you angry at? And I, I honestly couldn't tell him who I was angry at. I had it buried so deep. First of all, I didn't know I was angry. And I didn't realize that I was really angry at pastor. But as we talk, so how did I get over my anger? I'm giving you a very long answer to this, but it's it's compl it's complex. It's complicated when you're in deep pain. I mean, I think our go-to is anger. Uh, it, it starts with disappointment, you know, disbelief. Um, and then you internalize all that. Why, why am I doing this? What's, what's my problem? What's, so then it's anger turned inward towards yourself. And it, it just, you just pack it into your soul so deep. So that when I was finally able to tell him uh, that I'm angry at pastor, I can't even begin to tell you the emotional um, experience. It just, it was like, it just came up from inside of me. And I, I began to understand who I was angry at. And over time, just being able to talk about it, that's how I was able to, to walk through that and work through my anger. And then I realized I wasn't mad at God because it was not his fault. Uh, I wasn't mad at Jonas because it wasn't his fault. And I knew exactly where I could put my anger, but then there's still this part of me that I was ang I turned, I still turned the anger inward toward myself. I still carried the guilt and the shame of what I had done to my husband, what I had done to my family, my two beautiful daughters. And uh, even after all of that, I, I still felt the burden of that. And, um, but the more I um, did, therapy and counseling and the more I began to tell my story and little just snippets a little pieces of it to certain people very you know selective uh, I realized that as, as I openly uh, confessed not only to my husband uh, but to a few friends and a therapist somehow the anger toward myself began to subside and there's a verse found in James 5 16 has became my motto my my model my the verse that truly took me out of darkness into the light and that was found in james 5 16 confess your faults one to another like what i'm doing to you right now pray and then you'll be healed i know it's 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 so compact it seems so simple but i can tell you it's the most difficult thing Anyone does uh, if they've been caught in the dark world and they don't, they can hardly find their way out, but it's really the only way out. And as I began to learn how to share my life, my story, I began to learn how to actually learn how to talk instead of whine and complain and cry. I actually learned how to speak and talk to people, to friends or when, I'm sh when I was sharing my story. And over time, the anger subsided. And the grand finale of that all um, happened in 2003. Our daughter was killed in 1975. So all of those years. I will tell your audience, it doesn't have to take that long. But it wasn't until 2003 that I was sitting in my home on my favorite chair, just feeling things had gone wrong in our family one more time, just a lot going on. And I'm feeling myself going back into this depression. Anger will take you into depression. If you stay there long enough, anger is the end result. I mean, I'm sorry, depression is the end result of anger. And so I found myself just spiraling down, just, just I felt myself going down into this dark hole of depression. And I just, at that time, cried out and said, God, please help me. And uh, he spoke to me in that moment. It was not an audible voice but it was directly from heaven. It was an inner, huge interruption, interruption. And he said to me, Anne, I have done everything there is to do for you. And he listed all the things. First of all, he came to earth as a man. He loved the people, learned what it's like to be human. The people crucified him. He died and then he rose again. He said, today I'm sitting at the right hand of my father. And I'm praying for you and your family. And then he said, will you forgive yourself? 
I never heard of self-forgiveness. I didn't even know I needed to forgive myself. But it was so powerful and so strong that all I could do was respond and just say, yes. Yes, I will. And I did. Let me tell you, that was that was the biggest breakthrough of my whole journey. There was many breakthroughs during my that process of coming out of darkness into the light. But that was the biggest breakthrough. The shackles completely fell off. The, the waves of grace just rolled over me until there was nothing left but peace. And I have to tell you, from that moment to this day, I've never once felt guilt or shame. They are feelings. I mean, you feel guilt and you feel shame. I can tell my story. I can remember all the details of my story. I can remember how I abandoned my children emotionally, never physically. I can remember what I did, uh, how I hurt my husband. I, I can remember all of that. But there's no longer no guilt or no shame. And the reason for that is because the truth is, <laughs> so we love the fact that Jesus died for our sins. And that's fantastic. But he carried my shame. And to me, that just it's like when he said to me, I've done all there is to do for you. Will you forgive yourself? And I was carrying the shame because I could not forgive myself. Somebody had to pay. And I was paying through carrying the shame. So again, from that day to this, it, it, it left me. So that's why I can tell any part of my story. And why do I want to do this, John? Because I want your audience to, to know and to hear it one more time. I'm sure this is no, this is not a newsflash, you know, like everybody knows this. But we need to be reminded some people in your audience may, audience may be in a very dark place and they're feeling like they there's no hope for them. Life is over. I'm telling you uh, that that's a lie. Uh, there's hope. Um, it, for me, it was impossible to imagine uh, life again. Th there was just no hope for me. But I can tell you today, I love to share my story because the power of the gospel and the power of the, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. He covered all of it. He didn't miss anything. And he did that so that we could have life and live fully alive. I love a, a quote by Dr. Richard Dobbins. And he, he says that the tragedy is not in dying, but it's what dies inside of us while we live. And let me tell you, I was dead on the inside because of all the guilt and all the shame. But today, I'm alive. I love my life. I love my Savior. I love the redemption. I love my family. I'm walking in the light. Is life easy? No, no, you still live life. But you're in a whole other, I'm in a whole other world. And it's an amazing, uh, it's amazing to me how Jesus has redeemed every part of me.